This video describes how complex analytic functions can help solve problems in fluid flow, or at least rather simplify problems in fluid flow, by making use of something called the stream function. Baseline assumptions, we're not solving all problems in fluid flow. Baseline assumptions are the fluid is moving in a 2D region. D, we'll think of it as a subset of the complex plane. And the fluid is satisfying three properties. The first of all is that the fluid is incompressible. The fluid is inviscid. And the flow field is irrotational. Incompressible means the density is constant. Inviscid means no internal friction. And irrotational means no vortices. This is kind of easy to think about. The fluid can't spiral around like that. That's not allowed. If I take a look at relaxing these two conditions, I end up with potentially turbulent flow. So the fact that I've made these two assumptions means no turbulence can occur. Actually, turbulence is one of those problems that's quite difficult quite difficult to the point where we don't even have existence and uniqueness for solutions for the differential equations that describe fluid flow under the situation where turbulence happens. Incompressibility can be relaxed a bit more easily, but we're not going to in this case. Okay, the idea here, the idea is that the velocity of the fluid is described by a complex function v, and v is going to take a point in our domain, which is a subset of the complex plane, it gives you a complex number. The input is really the location, and the output is velocity vector. If you will, the interpretation is something like this. <coughs> if I have some region, well, let me, if I have some region, where my fluid is flowing, I can end up with a velocity field, perhaps like this, as in at each point, I have a vector emanating from it. And that vector field strings together along these streamlines that tell me how the fluid is moving. You'll notice the velocity field can change as you move through the fluid. And in order to figure out, in order to figure out uh, how this works, um, these three assumptions here conspire to make a, a rather simple situation here. That being that the velocity field is the gradient of a real valued function. And it's not really easy or obvious, but they lead to, the, lead to the following fact that there is a harmonic function, phi, let's 
So it's going to take some points in our domain and give you a real number. It's a harmonic function, so it solves Laplace's equation. And it works such that v is the gradient. Or put another way, it looks like this. You should think of the real component and the imaginary component as being components of our vector field. This, the imaginary component being the y component of the velocity. And the real part is being the x component. OK. So I'm not going to prove this fact. It's rather involved and deals with the Navier-Stokes equations that describe fluid flow and deals with how these three assumptions work with the Navier-Stokes equations. But let's just take it as a given that this happens, so that there's this harmonic function that gives me this velocity field. Now, since the velocity field is the gradient, that means um, as I move along one of these streamlines, I move up or down in my velocity field. So in particular, if I draw some level curves of this function phi, they look a bit like this. So these blue curves are level curves of phi. Because of that, this phi is a special name. We call phi, we call it the velocity potential. OK, now given this velocity potential function, so we can compute the velocity by computing the gradient of this, right away beware this is not the derivative in the complex sense. Um, we've got this velocity potential function. It is a harmonic function. And so if d is simply connected, we know it has a harmonic conjugate. rather, make that clear, phi has a harmonic conjugate. I'll call it C. This is called the stream function. And the result of that that the function f which is defined, again, on D. Oops, that's not an R, that's in C. Given by F of Z, F of X plus I, Y, phi of X and Y plus I, C of X and Y is analytic. F is called the complex potential. Of the fluid flow. OK, so just to, to, to back up here, phi the first term phi, this is our velocity potential. This is our stream function. This is the stream function. And so I have the velocity potential. I have the stream function. The velocity potential, if I take the gradient 
I get back the velocity. Okay. So that's all pretty nice. Now, the question, of course, is what happens if I take the derivative of f? Well, f is an analytic function, so it has a derivative. And, of course, it has a derivative, which means uh, that I can take the derivative any which way I like. All right, I can take any derivative I like. And I also, since it's analytic, have the Cauchy Riemann equations. What do the Cauchy Riemann equations say? It says, uh, it says the following. Okay, those are the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So, if I substitute these Cauchy-Riemann equations back into the formula for f prime, I get something that looks like this. Now, if you look at this, this is almost the gradient of phi. The gradient of phi is right here. In fact, this is the gradient of phi conjugate. We'll put it another way. Given f of z, we can compute. the velocity, which is v is f prime of z gradient, conjugate, f prime of z conjugate. Okay, well that's pretty handy. Another thing to realize here is that the strain function is a harmonic conjugate to the velocity potential, so in particular its level curves are perpendicular the stream function's level curves are perpendicular to the velocity potential's level curves. Looking right at this diagram here, you can see that the level curves of the stream function are tangent to the velocity field. So additionally, level curves of the stream function tangent to velocity field. These level curves, see, they're called streamlines. And so if you follow the streamlines, you'll follow the fluid flow. Now, let me, let me say a few words about boundary conditions. Boundary conditions in fluid flow are a little tricky. So the first thing is, if you have a, uh, if you have a solid boundary, Fluid cannot cannot cross through, so velocity field, i.e., streamlines, 
must be tangent to the boundary. So if I have a wall, this is a wall, and I have my fluid moving along, the fluid has to be moving like this, parallel to the wall. What does that mean? That means the streamlines need to be parallel to the boundary, tangent to the boundary. So the takeaway is this. The stream function is constant on the boundary. Now, since the stream function is a harmonic function and it's constant on the boundary, it's the solution to a Dirichlet problem. All right, so winding things back and summarizing a bit, if you want to understand the fluid flow in a region, and that fluid is incompressible, inviscid, and irrotational, and is in a 2D region of the plane, and furthermore, that 2D region in the plane is simply connected, what you can do is you can work with the stream function. You can set a constant on each component of the boundary. Go ahead and figure out what that solution is, solve Laplace's equation with for that Dirichlet problem, and that will recover you the stream function. You can then cook back its harmonic conjugate, find the velocity fluid potential, and off you go, you can find the velocity. Now, how do you find solutions to Dirichlet problems? Well, since we're in the complex plane, this is what the analytic functions are good for, and what conformal mappings are good for. So you can use a conformal mapping to transform the region D into a more reasonable region, solve for Laplace's equation on that new region, and off you go.